Well, good morning. Today's the last part in this series on prayer. We're looking at lead us not into temptation, right? Now, I know, because I've talked to some of you, you don't like this whole idea that Jesus had this structure of priorities for us to pray through. But I'm telling you, if you don't pray the prayer we're looking at today, or some kind of version of it, every single day you're setting yourself up for failure. Like there's a kind of naivety if you don't know the need of praying this prayer. All your theology's off. So hopefully we're going to correct that. Because there are some prayers you pray so you don't have to pray. <laughs> Let me say that again. There are some prayers you pray so you don't have to pray later, right? And this is one of them. So go with me to Luke's Gospel chapter 11 again. Uh, and we're going to read the whole prayer all the way through now. And I'll, I'll pick off these headings uh, afresh. Here we go. Father God, speak to us through your word. Luke 11 says this. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. You start with praise and worship. You focus on him, not you. Secondly, he said, your kingdom come. After you've praised, you're listening. Father, what is it you want to say? Start with him, not you. His will, not yours. Then you bring in the request. Here we go. Verse 3. Give us each day our daily bread. Ask for what you need. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. We talked about that last week. It's that like coming to the place of the clear conscience because the prayer of a righteous person gets the job done, right? We want that clear conscience. And now here we are today. Lead us not into temptation. All right. Hopefully it's clear what lead us not into temptation means. It's a simple request to God for help to overcome temptation. That we wouldn't fall into the trap of it during the day. It's that simple. I say hopefully though, because I think it's worded a little bit complicated. Like no one uses the phrase today, like lead us not into anything. Like if Nicola's in the kitchen, there's a whole pile of washing up, you know, and she's beckoning me into the kitchen. I don't say to her, lead me not into the kitchen. I say, don't lead me into the kitchen. So, you know, it's a little bit archaic, the phrasing there. Um, and I think that's probably the, the translators like NIV, ESV, Keep that phrase out of respect for the fact that it was the King James Bible that popularized this prayer, which has become familiar uh, in many different places, churches, even like political environments. Sometimes will they use this prayer. And so it's kind of out of to keep that sense of familiarity. But there's another problem, like to pray, lead us not into temptation. In modern English, it almost implies like, God could lead us into temptation, which is nonsense. Like, you wouldn't pray like, God, please, tonight, don't lead me to burgle my neighbors. You know, it's just ridiculous. God doesn't lead anyone into temptation. And it's just a problem with translation. Like, the King James Bible was like a, almost a word-for-word -word translation, trying to get it as accurate as possible. But word-for-word -word translation doesn't always work. I'm learning Spanish and the phrase like in Spanish, ya llegando, the word ya means already, uh, llegando means arriving. So that's the literal translation. So if someone rings me up and they says ya llegando, I'm thinking, oh, they're already arriving. But that's not what it means. It actually means, it's a way of saying, I'm on the way or I'm coming soon. So when we were in the uh, Dominican Republic, there were like posters and even graffiti saying, ya Cristo viene. And literally that means, already Christ comes. Already Christ comes. And I'm thinking, like, what kind of heresy is this? They're saying Jesus has already returned? Well, like, no, it's, it, the word ya already is used to kind of suggest imminence. So what it literally, what it actually means, instead of the word to word thing, is Christ is coming soon. And so here, with this, this like prayer, Lead us not into temptation. It's not praying, God, don't lead me into temptation, you tempter. It's saying, God, like, lead me out of temptation. Like, don't let me fall into this, which is the way the New Living Translation uh, translates it. So hopefully that's clear. But in case it's not, go with me now to James 
chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, which says this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when they are lured and enticed by their own desire. That nails it, doesn't it? Like, God is good. He's only going to lead you into good if you follow him. He doesn't tempt anyone. He might lead you into a situation where there's temptation there so you can conquer it, but he won't be the one tempting you. But the next point that James makes here also essential to understand. He said, Temptation comes from your desires within you. And this is really what I want us to lock and load, really understand. When you become a Christian, you get a new heart, the Bible says, with new desires to please God, to honor him and serve him. You get this connection with, with God, with the Holy Spirit. You have the, the righteousness of God, of Jesus himself, released on the inside of you. But... The other old desires don't go away. Through the power of Christ, we're to conquer those things, overcome those things. We still have a flesh that we need to discipline. And I don't know about you, but mine is like a spoiled child. You know, I'm, I'm sat there watching TV and the spoiled child flesh is like, Daddy, can we have that? Daddy, can we have that? Daddy, can we have that? Only what I'm looking at is other women and other people's stuff and covetousness and lust and the, the pride of life. All these things are kicking off in my flesh. And I need like a good parent to say, no, <laughs> no, no. And it's not just Netflix. It's the whole world, Jesus said, is under the evil one. And so Jesus said to his disciples, pray so that you don't fall into temptation. The night that he said that, he prayed all night. They slept. He overcame the world. They were overcome with temptation. We pray so we don't have to pray. All right, to really like land this, we're going to read another big chunk from the book of James. James chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse 3 down to verse 10. Here we go. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify you heart, your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. All right, we're going to just take this apart now. Verse 3, James says, look, the, the reason your prayers aren't being answered is because you're starting from a place of selfishness to spend what you receive on your own passions. Now, that doesn't mean passions the way we use it modernly, like, you know, our own kind of desires and dreams are things we want to see God do in the earth. It means selfish pleasures. That's essentially what it means. Selfish pleasures. Like, that's the cancer at the root of Christianity. Selfishness. And then the next verse, verse 4, he says that kind of way of looking at things, like spend everything on your own pleasure, you do, you do it your way. He said, that's the way of the world. You embrace that, that's the way of the world. And actually, you're turning away from God. These are like divergent paths. And then verse 7, he says, who's behind all this? It's the devil. You've got to resist the devil. So you've got like this selfishness. It's connected to the whole world system. It's powered by the devil. And all the way through this, especially verse 10, James is saying the key, the way out of this is humble yourself. Go low. Go as low as you can. Like recognize your need of God. And that's the prayer you pray so you don't have to pray. Like you're humbling yourself and saying, God, today, don't let me yield to sin. I need your help. 
Humility is the key Christian virtue. It's where it all begins. It's why the, the poor in spirit, they're the ones who are going to be receiving God. You know, like it's the meek who are going to inherit the earth. Like it's this, this hungering, thirsting for righteousness. I don't have it myself. I need it from you, God. Humility is the key Christian virtue. Now, this was exemplified to me this week for a friend of mine who's an alcoholic. And I happened to be with him as he was kind of confessing like his errors and failures to someone he'd hurt. And I watched him. It was beautiful. Like he didn't defend his sin. He didn't excuse his sin. He owned it. Like I hate those apologies where people say like, I'm sorry if you feel that way. Or, or they give some kind of like generic, like, please forgive me if I've done anything wrong. There was no ifs. He owned it specifically. I did this. It was wrong. Is there anything else you want to tell me where, I, where I've messed up or hurt you? They said more. They said, I didn't even realize I'd done that. I am so sorry owned it, humbled himself. It was beautiful. Later he said to me, he said, John, I don't have a choice. He said, I have to humble myself. I have to own what I've done. And, and he wept, he mourned. He was doing the James passage. And you know what he said to me? He said, John, they taught me at Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not going to make it unless the first thing I do every morning is to sincerely ask God to help me. You see that? It's the pray so you don't have to pray. It's the pre-prayer, right? It's the do not lead me into temptation, or like the King James. It, it's the don't let me yield to sin, New Living Translation, much better. Don't let me yield to sin. We pray so we don't have to pray. Now the problem is, most people in the church aren't alcoholics. Now, I know you're thinking, like, what do you mean, John? Like, you want more alcoholics? What, do you want me to start drinking? What are you telling me? Some of you know that I went to Cocaine Anonymous. Not because I'm a coke addict. I'm not, although I did take cocaine in my youth. I went there because I thought it was an open meeting and I was learning about doing addiction pro uh, programs. And I I've made it funny when I've told that story before. You know, the comedy of, like, people thinking I'm an addict and I'm not. But here's the reality. It was one of the most encouraging meetings I've ever been to. Because everyone there knows they're in the same boat. Like they all know they got a problem. And if you're there, you've got a problem and you need help out of that problem to walk in freedom. There's a, there's a humility and then a unity that goes with that. It's very, very powerful. And I left there thinking if only the church could be more like that. Like it's not just alcohol or cocaine or these, these other things that kill us, that destroy lives. At the root of it, what does James say? It's like this selfishness. It's spending on your own pleasures. And, and what if, as a church, we recognize, do you know what? we got a sin problem. we got a flesh problem to get through this. Like Peter says, we got this war that we're all in together. We're all facing temptation together. Let's encourage each other. Let's share our struggles with one another so we can get free. Walk in purity. Walk in holiness. Walk in righteousness because the power of a righteous person achieves much. Like, and what about our appeal then to the world? It would have that much more power because we're literally week in, week out experiencing the transforming power of God from one degree of glory to the next. And we're praying this prayer every day because we know we've got a flesh and we're not going to get through the day without temptation to selfishness. If we don't say, Lord, don't let me yield to temptation. I need your help. All right, so what I'm going to do to finish, I'm going to read the 12 steps from Alcoholics Anonymous. Like this is set up by Christians. It's based on Christian principles. And I want you to see how closely these steps connect with what James is teaching in James chapter 4. About humbling ourselves. Submitting to God. Recognizing our need of Him. Like really like recognizing the horror of the sin within us. You know like this weeping and mourning stuff. I, I want you to... See how closely these steps match that and how unfamiliar this practice probably is to the church. So let me read this to you. But instead of the word alcohol here, if your problem's cocaine, put that in there. If your problem's selfishness, put that in there. If your problem's greed, put that in there. If your problem's anxiety, put that in there. Let's read it. Let me read it to you. 
Step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Well, the only one higher power I know who can rescue is Jesus. He's the only one with power to save. So you can put that in there. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. That's the confess your sins to one another. That's right there. We were saying that last week from James. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asking him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. That's true repentance. That's the follow through, right? Number nine, we made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. Number 10, continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Number 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Number 12, having had a spiritual awakening of the, as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Is that profound? Can, can you see like the, the depth of repentance that, that's kind of being brought through here? You know, this like fearless moral inventory of our lives where we're falling short, this this kind of like deliberate, I'm going to make amends where it's appropriate with other people. I'm going to correct this thing. I'm going to follow through on it. This is why Alcoholics Anonymous works. It does. It really, really does. Like they say, work the program. The program works. It's rooted in scripture. It's rooted in the word of God. Like this is true holistic repentance. So all I'm going to ask of you this week with your prayer partner, I want you to read the 12 steps. I want you to have a think about them. Now, normally in a, a program like Alcoholics Anonymous, you take a step at a time and you might take months over each step until you own it. Like it's not something to be rushed into, but I want us to be provoked as a church community about how deep a transformation God wants to work within us. How deep the battle we're facing is. It is a war and we cannot wage this war without humility, without deliberately relying on God, confessing to one another and really praying that we would not yield, not one step to temptation. All right, that's it this week. I'm going to bring the steps on the screen. I want you to have a look at them for a minute uh, and then I'm going to pray. Well, God bless you, church. Let's pray. Father, I pray with all my heart this week for everyone who's heard this, we would learn to pray daily and we discover there's a power 
over sin. There's a power over bad habits. Lord, there's a power over selfishness and pride and greed that when we humble ourselves before you, you pour out generously upon us so that we can walk in greater and greater purity. Empower your people as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Don't ever forget you are so, so loved.